welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, and welcome to the Mad in the Family podcast. I'm Miranda Spencer, Parent Resources Editor at Mad in America. We have a twofer for you today. Our guests are Dr. Peter Bregan and Dr. Michael Cornwall. They're going to be talking about the use of medical devices to treat children and youth with emotional and behavioral issues and their new initiative to push back on that. It is called Stop the Psychiatric Abuse of Children, or SPAC. Now I'm going to introduce our guests. Peter Bregan, MD, is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist and a former consultant at the National Institute of Mental Health who has been called the conscience of psychiatry. For decades, he has made successful efforts to reform the field, including bringing a, a stop to lobotomy and psychosurgery. He has testified before the FDA and Congress, been an expert witness in many court cases involving the pharmaceutical industry, and has appeared on Oprah and 60 Minutes, to name a few. Dr. Bregan continues to criticize psychiatric drugs and electroconvulsive therapy and promotes more caring, empathic, and effective therapies. To that end, with his wife, Ginger, he founded the Center for the Study of Empathic Therapy, Education, and Living. He's the author of more than 20 books, most recently, Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. Dr. Bregan maintains a private practice in Ithaca, New York, where he treats adults, couples, and families with children. Michael Cornwall, PhD, is a Jungian Langian psychotherapist who went through his own intense experience of transformative madness without medication or treatment that formed his vocation. For over 30 years, he has specialized in providing psychotherapy for people in psychotic states in medication-free sanctuaries and community settings. He completed his doctoral study of Diabasis House, a Jungian early episode medication-free psychosis sanctuary, founded by Michael's mentor, Dr. John Weir Perry. Michael is also an Esalen Institute workshop leader and psychology graduate school lecturer and CEO trainer on alternative, alternative approaches to madness. Welcome, both of you. Hi, it's very you. good to be here. Thank you. Um, so what is SPAC and what forms of psychiatric abuse are you addressing? Well, if I would start that, um, SPAC, Psychiat Stop Psychiatric Abuse of Children, was uh, Peter's response to a recent development. Uh, maybe I should start talking about that, this device for children diagnosed with ADHD. It's called the Monarch ETNS device. It's an electrical device that's placed on the child's head all night uh, that's supposed to reduce uh, symptoms of kids who are labeled with ADHD. It was fast-tracked through the FDA earlier this year. And uh, when Peter and I found out about it, we started writing articles and uh, talking on Peter's radio show. And Peter has a video on, on YouTube about it. And basically, this device is uh, two electrodes that are pasted onto a child's head at night with a wire running back to uh, the, the, the electrical device about the size of a cell phone, and it, it pumps electrical current into the child's head all night long. And uh, it was quickly uh, approved by the FDA out of their uh, device section. Peter can talk more about that later, but there was no replication of the study. It was a very small study that started out with just 35 kids on the device. And at the end of a year, I think there were only 12 children. Who, two, two, Michael. Was it only two? Or two or three. Yeah, okay. Yeah, everybody pretty much dropped down. So there was this huge attrition rate of the people even in the study, and they still approved it. It's part of the uh, group down there in, in Southern California. I think it's UCLA research and then this uh, Neuro Sigma company. And what was uh, really alarming about it is one, the fact that it was so quickly approved by the FDA and also that the initial uh, press release by the FDA touted this device as uh, a, you know, a fairly harmless alternative to uh, stimulant medications. And at first they 
mentioned that there were uh, five main, what they called adverse events, fatigue, headache, trouble sleeping, drowsiness, jaw clenching, and increased appetite. And uh, then I did some further research around the product safety information on it and found out in addition to those what were reported by the children with this device on their head all night, also had lightheadedness, nightmares, tooth pain, rapid heartbeat, poor appetite, stomach ache, nausea, vomiting, frequent urination, constipation, itching, skin rash, and tingling skin. So we were so upset by this. Both of us have spent decades working with children and families and the, the abuses that we've both seen and fought against around uh, the medication and other abuses against children. This was uh, so uh, remarkable, this new electric device. And so we started this organization. Peter came up with uh, the name SPAC, Stop the Psychiatric Use, Abuse of Children. And since then, I think there's been over 25,000 responses to the articles we've written and uh, radio interviews we've done and uh, YouTube videos that Peter has done. So it's, uh, it's an Orwellian new thing that's going to be uh, sold for $980. And uh, I just recently saw that the Axios company, I mean, the uh, Neuro Sigma company partnered with a quick care pharmacy yeah. so that so they can distribute this nationally and uh, people can sign up for it now. So it's, it's kind of a brave new world thing that I think is, Peter's the expert on the brain, but that really uh, intrudes on the frontal lobe of the brain, according to Peter, and, and is harmful. So I'll, I'll just stop there. So that was the genesis of SPAC. Right. Um, a lot of questions come to mind. First of all, back up a little. This is purportedly to help kids with a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder. How on earth is this supposed to be beneficial? What's the theory and I, I, it sounds like it was fast-tracked very quickly, but um, it, it's hard to believe something like that could be therapeutic. On, on one hand, it sounds like it, it's extremely harsh treatment. On another hand, it seems al almost like how could it even do anything to you just putting, you know, a few little, you know, jolts into your, your forehead muscles. So um, can you address why they, it's alleged to be therapeutic and, and why it is actually harmful. Let me just say quickly for Peter takes that because he's the expert on that. What mm -hmm. was remarkable uh, in the FDA press release was the one sentence, uh, so-called science on why this would be helpful is they say it sends electrical current in to the area areas of the brain associated with ADHD. So there, I mean, right there, there's a huge kind of unfounded claims that they've identified areas of the brains that are associated with ADHD. But, but really, uh, Miranda, that's, that's the justification. That's kind of the scientific rationale that it's, it somehow, it says, it, it sends, you know, the, the electricity into the areas of the brain associated with ADHD. So maybe Peter can elaborate on that. Well, the, the areas they list, and this is very common in um, organized psychiatry, the areas they list as associated with ADHD um, basically are the brain itself, <laughs> and in particular, the front half of the brain, which is the part of the This is just a very common claim. Frontal lobotomy was supposed to affect whatever areas the lobotomist, uh, whatever issues the lobotomist was interested in. So if he was going to treat schizophrenia, it was the frontal lobes and the limbic system. Was there involved, supposedly? It was OCD. It was the frontal lobes and the limbic system, and so on and on. And now we're in the same position with this. You, these electrodes are stuck just above the eyebrows on each side of the, of the brain, front of the forehead, rather which puts them directly above um, the frontal lobes and their most sensitive area, the prefrontal cortex. I'm still trying to figure out, I don't know yet, I'm working with a neuroscientist who specializes 
in electrical uh, uh, machines. And um, we're looking at this. It's unclear how much is going right through the skull to the uh, prefrontal cortex, which is, that's exactly the area going all the way back to the 50s that the neurosurgeons wanted to cut up, dice up, electrically melt or otherwise destroy to reduce human beings to a more simple state, quite literally. Um, but there's something more going on because the electricity is passing through nerve endings that come down into the area of the face and the jaw. They cite the trigeminal nerve, but there are also other nerve endings coming down into those regions. And what they uh, seem to be doing there uh, is flooding back up these nerves, some of which are supposed to be coming down with their signals, others are going up with their signals, but this, whatever the nerve is pushing up, bits of electrical information that's that's going to be random and chaotic back up the nerves to flow back into the frontal lobes of the brain and basically all the emotion regulating parts of the brain. So in other words, while the brain is resting at night and trying to sleep, it's getting bombarded with nonsense misinformation, disruptions of normal information flow on a continuous basis all night long for as many nights as the practitioner can get the parents to do or the parents can get the practitioner to allow. There's no limit. It could go on for years, daily. And the studies, uh, Michael gave a very good summary of them. A couple of added things is the actual controlled study that is comparing the effects of the machine with electricity and the machine without electricity. The, the control is the machine without electricity, um, comparing them for four weeks. Now, of course, a real control would have been to compare the electricity machine, to then compare, compare it to a machine without electricity, and then do a real control, which is nothing. To see how the kids respond to nothing. Because goodness knows how they're responding to having a machine tacked to their forehead, because that is not good for them. Even if it doesn't do anything, it's going to morally undermine them, make them feel like guinea pigs, make them feel weird, make them wonder what in the world is the matter with me. I must be just terribly deformed or defective or weird or have this awful affliction of ADHD which is not a disease at all, just a bunch of behaviors that irritate teachers mostly. And uh, they don't even consider doing the real placebo, which is not to inflict anything on the child, in which case the children might have done much better than somebody either with the electricity or without it, but with a machine strapped on them. So the FDA is just failing our children. It is pushing stuff on our kids. There is no rationale. It's such a good question you asked, Miranda. There is no rationale. It's just do things to the brain of the kid. And if you look back at the history of, uh, of the stimulants, they don't have any better rationale. They're just messing up numerous neurotransmitter systems in the brain. So there's no better rationale for giving amphetamines and other drugs to the children. But what this will do by messing up neurotransmission in the brain, at the least, and we're going to look more and more deeply into it. Uh, my my comrade in the, who's the neuroscientist, uh, you know, with a specialty in electrical machines and stuff. Um, um, he, I've advised him not to involve his name at this point, but to wait and see what happens. Um, so he's going to be anonymous, not from me, but from the rest of the world for right now. Um, what's going to happen long term, generally, from all intrusions into the brain is the individual becomes more apathetic, less in touch, less engaged, less caring, less alive, less loving, just, you know, kind of 
less of an engaged human being in the world around him, the people around him, and less engaged with himself. His kids become less, more and more uh, unable to reflect on themselves as, as some harm is done to their brains. And I don't think that's what what's parents are, are looking for when they try things like this. Do you know how widespread the use of this Monarch device is yet? I mean, has it caught on? Um, I know it's being promoted. I think it's still being marketed, and we have no idea yet. What What do you know, Michael? Yes, I think it was um, in August where they started, uh, the NeuroSigna com- company started a early uh, sign-up option for for parents to go in and uh, sign up for for this device and then they were promoting it through like I said this uh, quick care pharmacy network to the to uh, distribute it nationwide so I don't know how many of the devices are actually out there yet but it's it's on the market and it is being sold and um, having worked in a public mental health system for 28 years I've seen how these different uh, treatments kind of come online and once they gain momentum uh, at some point they become part of the the standard of care or the best practice that uh, I could foresee you know in a couple three years there'd be you know tens of thousands of kids uh, with this uh, device in use. I think think over millions in a few years. Because you know they're 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 calling it, Michael, uh, safer than drugs. So as soon as they start catching the eyes of parents and teachers and doctors, this is going to go into the millions. Because we have uh, multi millions of children on psychiatric drugs now. Yeah, I think it's important in some of the stats around ADHD. I was just looking it up. The Center for Disease Control said so there's a, a 6.5 million uh, children in the United States have been diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, 388,000 of those children are aged 2 to 5, uh, 4 million aged 6 to 11. So it's an enormous market out there. I don't know if you remember uh, three or four years ago, the Center for Disease Control announced an urgent alert that they'd been going through kind of randomly a bunch of medical records, and they found that uh, at least 10,000 toddlers under the age of 3 were had been diagnosed with ADHD and, and we're being given uh, stimulant drugs. So uh, Peter is the expert too on how these treatments and these drugs and different things are, are prescribed off-label for, for children, which that's, that's why we, we talk about psychiatric abuse. You know, these innocent children, you know, a two and a half year old little boy or girl in a, uh, getting these kind of uh, treatments, drugs, this, this, this device, Monarch, says that they won't give it to anybody under seven. I mean, uh, yeah, but uh, still, I, I, I've just seen how this, these uh, devices and, and uh, treatments snowball, and pretty soon you have every, every, every child psychiatrist is going to be prescribing this. Oh, pediatricians, yeah. nurse practitioners. Um, excuse me for a second. One reason that happens, is, I think, is a lot of, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of drug prescriptions and other prescriptions for kids comes not from a child psychiatrist, but often their pediatrician or uh, primary care manager. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, the number of pediatric psychiatrists, very small. I mean, we've only, I think, got one around here. Uh, you know, for in a small city, um, but they're very, they're uh, very, very small numbers. Most, most of these things end up being the uh, the drugs, especially that you know they end up being given by family practitioners, mostly uh, primary care doctors of all kinds, and including you know physicians' assistants where they can do it, and nurse practitioners where where they can do it. But I think that we we shouldn't even think that this will be mainly even focused at ADHD because once it's approved, it can be given to any child. There is no law to prevent that. The only risk the person takes is getting sued if if they can find a lawyer to, you know, spend all the money or or a family to spend all the money to argue that it was uh, not given properly. They'll give it to depressed kids, anxious kids. They'll give it to kids who have uh, 
had trauma. The, one of the, uh, and they'll do it freely, the docs, especially because this was not even developed for ADHD, which is very important to emphasize. I looked through the evolution of uh, the patent and the evolution of the research cited by the FDA as backup research, and it's research for head injury, among other things. They're claiming this is going to help head injury, this is going to help depression. It uh, was given a lot in uh, a different form, but given a lot to veterans uh, um, who have all kinds of issues when they have PTHD. That you mentioned things being used off-label or for a variety of, of causes beyond what it's originally uh, intended for is the treatment called ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, um, which also is used on children. Um, I know, Peter, you've, you've done a lot to try to fight that. Can you explain briefly what it is and why it yeah. is of a piece uh, with these kinds of treatments that you feel um, really should never be used on kids? Yeah. Let me, let me start by pointing out resources that I have right on my website. Sure. Um, I have a, uh, a free electroshock resources center. It's just huge. Um, a couple of hundred scientific articles, a, a pamphlet you can give to families or hand out at protests or just a lot of different things on it. And you can get to that without going to bregan.com and just go to, uh, you know, www.123ect, 123ect.org. And um, on my website, if you circle, you go to the website and you'll see four green squares with topics and go just below that. And right away, you'll get into um, into SPAC. You'll see a SPAC uh, emblem and it's in the Children's Resources Center. And you can go in there and find articles and, and the FDA's claim that it's going to be safer than drugs, which is just shameful and untrue. And also, I'm going to be talking about this a lot on my radio show. Michael will be back. And I want to make the most fun announcement I could possibly make. And that is that my Wednesday radio show, as of tonight, is going to also be a TV show. So it will be filmed. And so after the live radio show, within two or three days, uh, on my YouTube channel, there will be, under under TV, you'll see the radio, what started out live as the radio has been was filmed at the same time and will be like a weekly TV show. We're going to have features and stuff. It's going to, I'm going to try to make it really up to professional standards of uh, something you'd watch on TV. So... This will be That's fun. Right. There'll be a, be a screen call. I might have two or three guests uh, on the screen, and I'm on the screen. It's, sometimes it'll be just me. It's going to be really interesting. But So there's a ton of information on ECT on, on my website, including an article which you could search for, Children and ECT. Um, because I was asked to join an article written by several women who were deeply concerned about uh, international increase in pushing for ECT for kids, including in the uh, U.S. And it's, of course, uh, it's child abuse. Child abuse takes many forms. I mean, when, just because somebody wears a suit doesn't mean they're not driven to abuse children. And I don't think there's any other way to look at this and really to look at a lot of the drugging and really to look at the, the monarch. We're basically doing harm to children without any kind of guarantee or even speculative reason to believe we're going to help them. We're intruding on on nature's most complex, subtle, and marvelous place in the, that we know of in the whole universe, the brain. Mm -hmm. I, I like to say the brain is more complicated than the rest of the universe. Your brain, my brain, everybody's brain is a more complicated thing than the whole universe with all the galaxies and everything. We don't know the operating system. We don't have an Einstein of the brain. We don't have a, even a, a Kepler of the brain. I mean, uh, we really don't. We have no knowledge about how the brain makes thoughts, uh, let alone uh, emotional upsets. Um, uh, the brain is, is just uh, 
it's really a dark continent for us. And to just go and spew neurotoxins and electricity into it is bizarre. It's kind of an uncontrolled experiment in a way. Well, it's an uncontrolled experiment that will not produce any information that we don't already have, which is it's not good to do this to the human brain. It's not even good to do it to any mammal's brain. I think we know enough to stop experimenting on animals with ECT, let alone on children. Right. So it's a, it's a disaster. And ECT works by putting electrodes in a very similar place to where the uh, electrodes are going in the monarch device. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit more back to the temples if it's bilateral. But if it's a uni- so-called unilateral, one goes over a temple and the other goes over the further back on the side of the head on the other side. Um, it, it, it ECT causes a major convulsion followed by a coma, literally a coma, and severe concussive symptoms. After the very severe convulsion, there's a flattening often, and, and the shock docs like that flattening, where the brain waves look dead. They look dead for 10, 20 seconds. I mean, what what is that to do to a human being? Then the person gradually revives, but the brain waves remain abnormal for a long time. And after multiple ECTs, they stay abnormal for a large percentage of the patients. The patient wakes up in a state of severe traumatic brain injury. The person has no memory for the event. The person is confused. The person doesn't awaken for several minutes Those cr- and, and has major me- uh, memory loss both surrounding the event but also going back further. Now, any neurological textbook would just Google traumatic brain injury or the scales for it, and that's a severe traumatic brain injury. It's, it's much worse than, say, the concussion that uh, puts a person unconscious for maybe a few seconds at the most, usually. person awakens, say, within an hour or half an hour. They're themselves completely. They don't have any long-term memory loss. They probably don't men- remember the concussion, but it's not for, like, half the day. Like, it, you're not going to remember after ECT, and eventually the whole day disappears. So, as you proceed. So... Uh, we're talking about a very severe damaging event, which if seen in an emergency room would be lead to a hospitalization, overnight observation. And if the, and if it had been associated with a seizure, seizure medication to prevent another one instead of two to three days later, or maybe even the next day with some of these abusers to give, get another concussion. But it's, it's actually worse than a concussion. It's definitely severe traumatic brain injury. And we've now forced one of the uh, in a lawsuit that I was involved in as the expert on science. Uh, we got um, Thymatron, one of the two North American ECT makers, to, ad- to admit in writing to the FDA that their machine caused mem- serious memory loss and brain damage, quote, brain damage. And they did that after a judge read my, uh, basically, you know, my information, my report, and the, and the, and the and, uh, attorneys and what they had to say about it, both sides. And, and the judge said, there's enough evidence here of brain damage to go to trial. So they just settled. But the F, to give you an idea how bad, and I'll finish in a minute on this. And But to, to get an idea how bad the device's division is of the FDA, within days of this admission from the, drug, uh, the manufacturer, the FDA device division for the first time in history approved these. It had just been mum on it up to then. So it was coordinated to rescue them while they made their admission. Hmm. It's a terrible situation. I was going to ask, um, you know, when you hear this, it's like a parent considering what can I do to help my kid and make things better in our household and better in school. You know, this is pretty terrifying to hear, but when parents feel they've tried everything, sometimes they're willing to you know, go to extremes to get to get help. So what are some of the alternatives? We're, we can have a whole other show on this in the future, but 
if not these technologies that people put so much faith in, what are better ways to help kids who are mm-hmm. hyperactive, who are depressed? You know, what are the alternatives? Well, first, if we're just talking about kids who are labeled ADHD, which means that the symptoms from from the official diagnosis are things like talks out of turn, um, interrupts the teacher, um, doesn't pay attention, talks out of turn, doesn't sit still, you know, doesn't stand on line. We're not talking about a sick child. We're talking about a child. And this is how they sold it to the teachers. The teachers were the ones who started this whole thing. And uh, they sold it to the teachers. because So those are all things that a poor teacher doesn't manage well in a class or that even a good teacher can't manage in a very overcrowded, difficult class. So it's got nothing to do with what alternatives do you need. It's not like a, a mental illness. It's just some behaviors that are annoying or that get the kids in trouble. And by far and away, the most common attribute of these kids is they're the youngest in the class. So they're less mature. So you could do anything from let the kid repeat a grade to move the child into a class if the problem's at school. Then I'll talk about if the problem's at home. If the problem's Mm -hmm. at school, you you could uh, meet with the teacher and explain to the teacher that you'd like the teacher to move your child to the front of the class, not the back. That that he'll be less annoying in the front of the class than he is in the back. Um, but she just stop by and you you give permission for her to put a loving hand on his shoulder in case she's shy about that and call him by name and uh, ask him to take a look at the board and uh, remind him that his mind is wandering and just do the things that a good teacher will do uh, to a, with a boy who's usually a boy who's having a problem. And if little Janie's looking out the window, see, they expanded this to an attentiveness um, in order to get the daydreaming girl who's like bored in class or is much more excited about a little boyfriend. I mean, some 10 years old, 10 year old kids, uh, girls are planning their weddings already or they're thinking about poetry or maybe they're wondering, you know, how are they going to get ahead the way the boys do? I'm, who knows? I was once a young girl. I stared out the window a lot when I should have been paying attention. <laughs> oh, yeah. I developed a science just looking at my teacher with a, an interesting look on my interested look on my face. Well, I thought about other things because my head, <laughs> all my life has been full of interesting things. Michael, you were going to say. Well, well, just about you know picking up on what you were saying uh, in your question, Miranda. How how do parents navigate this whole uh, you know world of of, of school and and this is having some difficulty and. Uh, we know so much now about uh, trauma and childhood adversity and, uh, you know, the, the psychosocial elements that come into kids having distress that I think it's really, Peter and I are, have great compassion for families and parents who, you know, from day one, even when uh, the, the mother was, was, was pregnant, you know, we, we entrust we entrust the, our children's care to to these uh, medical professionals and, and pediatricians. And so when it gets to the point when they're starting to go to kindergarten or first grade or second or whatever, and the child's having some difficulty, if the school system and if kind of the whole culture around is saying, you know, they, it looks like they have one of these psychiatric diagnoses. I, I worked in the schools for many years with kids, and I was really involved with not uh, pathologizing them, connecting with the principals and teachers. But for uh, parents, I'll just give a quick example. Uh, a mother came to me who was feeling a lot of pressure uh, and didn't know what to do. She was a single mom just in the last couple of years about her little five-year-old uh, child. And uh, I said, well, we can do family therapy. We can do the, the, you know, I can see the boy individually and everything. And she said, that's great. Let's try that. And then she, she says, well, but I'm just really afraid that, you know, they're saying that they need to see a psychiatrist. So she took him, you know, to see uh, a psychiatrist in one of these HMOs. And the report back to me was they spent about 15 minutes with the, 
the child psycho- psychiatrist, which could have been a pediatrician. But, and, and basically, the psychiatrist reached into a drawer. The little boy was there on the floor, reached into a drawer, pulled out a plastic model of the human brain and said, right here, he pointed to the brain, he says, right here is where your problem is. You have what's called ADHD, but the medication I'll give you today will, will help that. Mm-hmm. So right from the beginning, you know, here's another situation of a trusted physician saying this is the problem so i have a lot of sympathy and compassion for parents who are trying to navigate this this whole uh, you know this whole area of, of of drugs or putting the monarch etns device on their kids head. yeah one of the things i do um when the kids come in and one of my favorite stories um is you know the the, the little boy who comes in and i ask him do you know why you're here and he says, um, yeah, I hear you're the doctor who doesn't like to give drugs for ADHD. He's a 10-year-old. And I said, that's right. And furthermore, um, I don't like to give drugs for for uh, any, any of the dis- these things. And and, uh, and I don't even think ADHD is, is a valid diagnosis. And he looks at me and he says, boy, the other doctors must hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and we have we do we have a good laugh but mom and dad cringe you know they're they're really worried about the he's really hurt my feelings or something and i tell him you are so so right and uh, and you're brave to tell me that and i and I, this little boy and i and i said and i heard that you um you attacked your last psychiatrist um when he uh said he wanted to put you on these uh new drugs or the antipsychotic drugs and you actually attack them. Now the parents really cringe. And he says, yeah. And I said, that was very brave too. He said, you kind of remind me of myself because you know, I attack psychiatrists too, but you always have to figure out when it's safe to take on somebody powerful. And if you work with me, you're going to learn real quickly how bad it is in terms of your safety to attack a teacher and to attack a psychiatrist is really, really dangerous because they'll lock, get mad at you and lock you up. I want you to learn really how to use your wonderful, wonderful strength. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to love working with you. And then uh, say in another case, the parents bring in the um, neuropsych testing. So I sit down with the child who's been told he's abnormal. Oh, by the way, these children leave the session smiling and laughing. Huh. Uh, the mother may call me and say, he sang in the car for the first time in years. I forgot he used to sing in the car when we would go places. And I tell him there's nothing wrong with them. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you at all. Um, now, maybe, uh, but I'll get to the kid whose behavior is real problem. Right now, we're just looking at these school kids who, who just, you know, they don't get along in school. They need a better school. They need a better teacher uh, uh, and things like that, mostly. Um, then then comes the issue if the, if the child has a problem at home. And then I tell the parents, either way, it's a good news. If your kid's problem is only at school, then we fix it. And if, the, if your child's problem is at home, that's even better because that's just with you and we can fix that easy when you learn how to handle it. And it's all going to work out. This is not hard. I give you a guarantee. And the only thing I guarantee, I give you a guarantee that on, only place in my practice I guarantee that you work with me for three weeks on how to express love and discipline at the same time and really become a moral authority in your child's life. I guarantee you, your child's going to be better. And you and I, we may go on and talk together, husband and wife, or whoever's coming in, grandmother. And um, probably won't even need to see your, your daughter or your son. Because as you get a hold of learning how to discipline, those behaviors that have been problem, not listening, interrupting you all the time, fundamentally being disrespectful. We're going to learn how to teach respect in a loving way. For example, I'll, I'll say, when you go home tonight, and I'll say this to all, whoever's in the room, including the kid, I say, when y'all go home tonight, uh, Timmy, if you're disrespectful to mom, I, I don't expect mom to respond at all. I don't, I don't care what you want, whether you're hungry or you're angry or whatever. I'm going to say, mom, if he's disrespectful, you just say, Timmy, you know, I'm, I'll talk to you when you're respectful. I mean, God knows, Timmy, you're so respectful to me here in the office. You're totally respectful. You certainly have that physical ability. 
but I want you to relate to your mother and dad with complete respect. And I'm going to ask them just not to, re- not to relate to you until you change the smirk on your face and let go of the snarl or whatever. I'm not telling them to go away and leave you all alone and put you in a room. I'm just saying, take a break. So you're respectful. Now I expect them to be respectful to you too. And then he might bring up the things they do. And I'll say, well, I expect mom and dad to stop that this week too. I mean, they shouldn't be arguing in front of you. You shouldn't be awake at night hearing what sounds like somebody being hit. That's, that's all got to end. And I'm going to cooperate on this because I'm going to help you all get together. And now let's talk about, um, you know, you, I mean, you ever spend time with your dad and it'll turn out almost every child I see. But Timmy hasn't had a long time in something he loves with his father in months. And he may even say to uh, uh, the father may say, well, he doesn't want to do anything with me. And I say, well, you know, what did you ask him to do? Oh, no, I don't think he wants to go to the hardware store. <laughs> he may not want to go and watch a bowl. No, no, you got to figure out, uh, Timmy, would you like to do something fun with your dad? Yeah. And then we arrange something. It's homework. Right there and there, we arrange something for Saturday. And then if that's going to offend his little sister and make her jealous, then mom goes out with the little sister. <coughs> Excuse me. It's build, building a family, building love and discipline, common sense. And it works with these children. But I'm referring quickly just back to the Michael's talking about who have a lot of trauma. The process is very much the same, just harder. Very much the same, but harder because you've got to work with a family that may have inflicted real trauma or family that it's allowed it or, you know, you're going to have more complicated situations, but the same thing is true. You teach the parents how to love and how to treat their kids with discipline. Michael, does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Uh, that approach. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be uh, doing a webinar on Mad in America, this new uh, system change for mental health, green mental health, on uh, Tuesday, November 19th at 1.30. That's really going to focus a lot on what you're saying, Peter, on how uh, parents and uh, caregivers can respond in that compassionate uh loving way even in the most dire circumstances those years i worked for in the county was really uh with a lot of kids and families who were in extreme distress and poverty and gangs and violence and everything like that that you know often it was a single mom or it was a grandmother taking care of two or three children or you know uh foster care or or group homes but the principles are exactly the same that kind of uh, heartfelt caring of, of uh, a caregiver like you or I. And I, I think it, 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 it really points back to the basic belief system that, say, you and I and some of the people who will be listening to this on Mad in America have, is that the psychiatric disease model of human emotional suffering and for children suffering, that the way it pathologizes uh, people that's that's an enormous impediment to, to connecting with people and to actually seeing their needs uh, as human needs instead of medical needs. So when I come with kids and families who have been through really you know, kind of a war zone uh, life, uh, I obviously you know attribute a lot of what's going on for them to their circumstances. You know, it's more than just the nature versus nurture. It's really, uh, if, if, if we don't believe what psychiatry says is true, and we don't practice that way, then what do we do? And I think the alternative is this compassionate, trauma-informed, humanistic approach that you do with every person. I can hear it in your voice and what you say, Peter, is that connecting with people as real people and uh, supporting them in, in a nurturing way. And uh, I, I was smiling when you said about your guarantee. I found myself after a few years if a single mom would come in with a couple of teenagers who were really out of control maybe even getting suspended going to juvenile hall even i would say you know i've had really good results if you if you come in with your your teenage son here for i'd say a month 
and we do this individual therapy and family therapy, the odds are really, really high that this is going to change. I almost, I almost got to the guarantee point where, you know, it, it's such a powerful thing, uh, especially and, and what you said, too, is I surprise parents in every session at the end of them kind of going through the laundry list of things they were afraid of and uh, concerned and upset about what their child was doing. And then I'd ask the child, and what would you like your mom or dad to change? And the parent would go, yes. well, wait, wait, we're not really here to fall. I go, no, no, I'm smilingly, you know, no, this is, you know, we're all together in this. So let's see if, if there's something you would, you know, if you're daughter or son here would like would like you to change and almost invariably there'd be this big smile come on the child's face and they'd say you know sometimes it'd be pretty serious you know i i I need him i need dad to stop hitting me and then you know we get into the whole area of of, uh, mandated reporting but often it would be you know i would really you know sometimes there'd be tears i'd really like them to stop fighting or I'd, 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 you know, so th- that whole kind of holistic way of looking at a family system and then the larger system of the school, it, it can be incredibly effective. And I think that's so what motivates me is I, I know that there's an alternative to what psychiatry provides. I know it. And so when you have that, that knowledge, then you can uh, offer it. What I'm hearing is we started out talking about the high tech treatments. And what I'm hearing is, I guess I would call it low-tech treatments, kind of back to basics. Um, It reminds me of something I suddenly remembered. I read in one of Peter Bregan's books, which is, Billy, you don't have attention deficit disorder. You have dad's attention deficit disorder. (laughs) Am I quoting that right? Yes, (laughs) D-A-D-D. In my practice, which is with good people who really do care about their kids, it's not like a lot of the families that Michael is working with that are really, you know, full of rage and anger. And, and I'm sure many of them are very alcoholic and no, no, uh, no father at all, hardly any support system for many of them in the state system. These parents are very cooperative and they're very, they're happy to have encouragement to spend more time with their children by and large, unless they, you know, occasionally very disturbed. But and they, they're just relieved to know they can love their kids and discipline them and do both. What they often don't believe is that their ch- kids would ever listen to them. The parent will say to me, you know, he'll never, let's say the boy's not there, he'll, he'll never listen to me. And I said, as long as that's what you're thinking, it will fulfill itself. But I want you to go home and act like when you said something to your son, two or three times in a kind and loving voice and said, that's it. No, don't contradict me. If you keep contradicting me, I'll simply end the conversation. But you have to be upstairs at 10 p.m. tonight and then just walk away. And if he's not up there by 10, you go back and you say, now, at some point, you're going to have to listen to me. And you have to go upstairs. And you just act like you are going to be obeyed. You're going to be shocked at how much obedience you get. And they have no idea of, of that. That persistence, sincerity, directness, assumption that the child will listen takes most intact families and turns them around in a day or two hmm. when the parents begin to do these things like that. When the parents assume they have moral authority. And I have a chapter about that in um Talking back to Ritalin, to talk a couple of chapters about how parents and start changing your attitude and stuff changes. And I also want to emphasize, along with Michael, that none of this is very different when you're working uh, with the walking wounded or the child who's actually normal and just doesn't fit into school, uh, which I think is very normal. Um, or uh, somebody who is hallucinating. You you approach with kindness and patience, a belief that you can build a trusting relationship with the people you're dealing with. And that's what it's basically all about 
And physicians in general get almost no training in what we used to call the bedside manner. And psychiatrists are the worst. You'd think they'd be the best. They're the worst because they view people as diseases, not even as people. In my experience, interns are more caring and loving to their, toward their patients than our psychiatrists. Really sad. Can you uh, remind us again uh, how people can, can learn more and get involved with SPAC? I could quickly say uh, we have a dedicated email address, uh, SPAC, S-P-A-C, victory at outlook.com. You can uh, write to us there, and a lot of people have. We've had a huge response uh, since Peter and I launched this. Uh, and that, that email goes to Michael. He's director. Yeah. And we at the, the, the Center for the Study of Empathic Therapy are the sponsors and, you know, coordinators and co-workers. Michael's the director, and he's the one that you'll get a response from. Right. What, are, what, are, what kind of response are you getting? You said you've got overwhelming response from parents. What are they telling you? Well, it's, it's really uh, all these decades of doing this. There's something about this, especially this monarch ETNS, that has – really uh, touched people and, and scared them. And so the, re the response is, uh, this, this seems wrong. I, I don't want to do that. And uh, from parents, I hear that. Parents are then questioning, well, maybe these medications that my child is getting are uh, harmful potentially too. And, and then from caregivers, uh, there's been people international all over contacting us, people giving information and suggestions. So uh, that's what we're hoping for is this kind of this network. You know, like I say, there's been over 25,000 views of what we've put oh, out. It's a lot, a lot more than that now. I, is did, it? I did a show on an alternative uh, network. The show is called, um, oh, it'll come to me in a minute. But it's going to be up on my website. And that was 25,000 views oh, in the first week. Yeah. So this is uh, going out and... Um, and many thousands on um, uh, uh, from the um, uh, blog I put out. Yeah. Yet another website. The stuff's going out all over. I have these fantasies of what I hope. I, for example, I think it would be wonderful if Michael uh, could develop seminars that people would take on how do you really relate and help your children and why you don't want to do drugs and and maybe these could be. Uh, you know, paid, paid or small amounts of money or whatever Michael could work out. If I invite people, I invite people to pester Michael into doing some okay. workshops <laughs> where he would make, also get paid to do this because he, you know, he's trying to make a living. I have courses up that could become a part of, uh, let's say, a family want the, wants to organize other families to get their kids off drugs. I have a book out on psychiatric drug withdrawal. Uh, has children's section. Um, I've got uh, courses now that people can take uh, on uh, how to do empathic therapy, uh, how to withdraw. You'll find all that on my website. Uh, a lot of it is done through um, uh, platforms created by my friend uh, Pam Popper, but you'll find them on my website. One of them I have 25 videos. Others are smaller than that. So uh, I'm putting out a lot of information. I hope people will form groups, I, uh, not just about this honor thing, but about all the abuses of children and, and how to join together and figure out ways to really help their kids because it is hard to find that. Yeah, and I think maybe one way that you can parents can act in addition to this is to, you know, ask questions of the doctors that are trying to push these treatments and be willing to maybe say no, kind of trust their parental gut that you can say no to your doctor if, if you've really thought it over. Well, yeah, by and large, it's not too safe. Um, doctors get very angry and parents who have absolutely refused drugs for their children may find themselves being called by Family protect, Protective Services in the county. So I would say that the better way, when you ask a very few questions, you say to the doctor, well, I'll call back for a follow-up appointment. I haven't got my schedule with me. And you leave. 
Do not get involved with an, anything remotely antagonistic with a drug pushing doctor, especially if he's a psychiatrist or she's a psychiatrist, because they're very touchy. They must know. They're, you know, they're like child abuse. When you see a parent abusing a child in public, it's dangerous to tell the parent, go up and say, hey, you know, well, if your kid, because when he gets home, he'll tell the kid, you embarrass me and beat the heck out of him. These are abusers like that. You don't want to entice them into being overly interested in you. Just slip away as mm-hmm. gently as you can and look for other services. Look for maybe a clinical social worker that you call in advance and check out she's not going to get drugs. I mean, send the kid for drugs or marriage and family counselors, folks that, that aren't top heavy with degrees and especially the MD degree. So I, I, I'm. Be gentle about how you challenge doctors. I'm even careful as a doctor if they recommend something to me. I'm I'm cautious. They get very annoyed. Yeah, yeah. I guess what I'm emphasizing to parents is, and that's very sage advice, it's just, um, I guess it, ultimately it is their choice. Um, that's right. Well, if they don't antagonize the doctor enough that the uh, or the school enough, the school will do it to end up with uh, a call from child and family services. So you, you just need to, you don't want to antagonize these people by asking them too many questions. They don't have answers for any of them. Wow. I, I don't think it's safe to question doctors very much. I think that you want to read if you if you go online and you simply Google what people are randomly saying on the internet for an hour or two, you will learn from that haphazard source more about the harm of psychiatric drugs than ninety five out of a hundred prescribers. Mm-hmm. Based on real life experience. Yeah. Michael, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, well I'm really grateful to what you're doing. Uh on Mad in America with the, the parent and family resources and Peter's dedicated part of his website on that too. I, I think the whole uh, message of SPAC or Stop the Psychiatric Abuse of Children is not just uh, about the dangers of some of these treatments, but both the, both the other messages, that the, 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 the good news is there are, there are alternatives, there, there are really effective, uh, compassionate things that, that uh, parents can uh, provide for their children. So, so I think that's part of always been my motivation over the years as I've seen uh, kind of a hegemony of the medical model take over is basically to say, we've got an alternative uh, that, that, that you can, you can choose, you can choose an alternative. And so th- that's, that's what they, they'll see when they read these articles about SPAC is that you can, you can find alternatives. And I think when parents are armed with that, then when there is that pressure from school, there is that pressure, you know, they can make a, you know, a really informed choice. Anything else you'd like to add before we conclude? One of the worst things psychiatry is doing is it's disenfranchising parents and teachers so that they no longer believe that every child can be saved by love and discipline and hard work. Um, there was a movie uh, years ago where a priest said in the movie, you know, no child is incorrigible. Now we've labeled Almost most of our children is incorrigible, meaning they can't be reached by ordinary adult uh, love and care. We need dimension. We need drugs. And it's just not true. And we need all these other awful things. It's not true. So we can reach our children. That is a fantastic note to end on. This has been the Mad in the Family podcast. Our guests were Michael Cornwall and Peter Bregan, and you can see more of their work at madinamerica.com slash parents. Uh, I'm Miranda Spencer, and this has been Mad in the Family. Thank you for listening to the Mad in America podcast. Visit madinamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.